All right. I, um, we are very pleased to have uh, giving our lecture today, Dr. Fanen Ade, and he is a proud graduate of the Oxford Center for Mission Studies. So he's one of our own. Um, uh, his research interests are in the areas of human development, humanity in development, communitarian values, and Ubuntu. Fanen is also working on a thesis, the Proclamation and Demonstration Nexus. Fanen currently works for the World Bank as a social protection specialist in the Nigeria country office. All, uh, all views will be expressed at the upcoming OCMS lecture are personal to Fanen and not to be attributable to his place of work. Fanen is married to Rahel and with children, um, Johanna, Gracia, and Ishak Fanen. Um, are, are all his wonderful children. So with that blessing, please go ahead, Fanon, you, you may begin. Thank you very much, Tom, and uh, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Just to check if you can hear my audio, Barrow, just thumbs up, if you can hear my audio. Just thumbs up, if you can hear me very well. We can, can hear you okay. Me? It's a little bit mixed, but, but do go ahead. Okay, I'll try to uh, speak up and shout a little bit. Yes. Thank okay. you very much for having me. Uh, I is uh, is glad to be back to OCMS and uh, trying to share my reflections as a practitioner with all of you. So this is uh, for me uh, both uh, a discussion about how a practitioner conducts himself in his place of work, but also how he looks at himself as somebody coming from um, maybe maybe a Christian background, if you want, and also living in the community and being part of the community he's trying to influence. So I will be talking to you about the title, which I call Humanity in Development, the reflections of a practitioner. What people tend to hear a lot is human development. And what people tend to relate with is human development approach or theory or human development indices or index. Now, what I'm trying to come up with here is closely related to that, but has a variation to it. So let's, uh, let's try to understand what human capital development is as conceptualized by a lot of the theories that we hear about. So human capital development consists of knowledge, skills, health, and the, uh, 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 the let them realize their agency and, uh, and, and, and full potential as productive members of a society. So in, in broad terms, that's the definition of human capital development. Uh, learning, health, skills, education, and the accumulation of that enables people to realize their full potential as functioning members of a society. Now, how do you measure human capital development? When, when you talk about measuring human capital development, you look at skills uh, and adult acquires over the total lifespan of uh, his, his, uh, his existence, as well as his own adult life. And then overall, the total population of a society. So what skills do you have as an adult? And then measure against the total population of a society. That is the way human capital development is measured. The average years of schooling of a country's population. Now, in, in summary, if you hear human capital development, just focus on the average years of schooling of a country's population. Now, if that is the uh, definition of human capital development, my conceptualization is humanity in development. In the course of my research in OCMS, I was, uh, I had the opportunity to collect data and I had to go back to Nigeria from OCMS frequently to collect data in Africa, here in Nigeria. Now, when I met the people I was interviewing and tried to collect data from, the question that uh, one, one clergyman asked me is, 
I hear you about human capital development, and you have tried to define it as the average cooling of a country's population. Now, I want to ask you, what does it mean to be human to you? Because if you say human development, human capital development, I hear that. I hear the capital. I hear the development as you conceive it. But how about the human? Now, this clergyman, school in the former sense of Bible, and he was a preacher in the local church, and but if by definition, population, he may not be counted of a population. Yeah. You want to say something, Tom? Yeah, I mean, we just missed the uh, sentence where you were saying when he was talking about what it meant to be human definition. and the definition. So if you, and, uh, the other thing I would say, Fanon, is just talk a little bit slower. Okay. Okay. So, in the course of collecting data for my research, I came across a well-enlightened and educated, if you want, clergyman. He was not educated in the Western sense of having a degree or degrees, but he could read the local Bible in the local language, and he could preach to the local congregation. But he was very wary of my definition of human capital development as average years of schooling of a country's population. Now he said he hear he can hear me on human capital development. I have tried to explain capital and development in my own understanding, but he then asked me a fundamental question that I did not think about that became the central crux of my research. His question to me was, what does it mean to be human to you? If you are defining human capital development, and you say it's the average years of schooling of a country's population, I get that. But I want to understand from your own perspective what it means to be human, because I am a human being. I may not have gone to school, I do not have a degree or degrees, but I am also educated. So how do you compute that or how do you factor that in your definition of average years of schooling? Because I did not go to formal education, but I am educated in my own right. I can read the Bible, I interpret, I have sense. So that was one part in, my, in the course of my journey as both a student in OCMS, but also my personal reflection on, oh, I didn't think about human in the three words of human capital development. So I had to take a step back and have to reflect on what does it mean to be human? Now, this man told me a story. He said, when people come here and they look at him, and they look at the people that he's ministering over, they tend to ask them, how many of you have a degree? It doesn't infuriate him, but he's asking himself, why are you asking how many of them have a degree? The first thing you should recognize is you are coming across a bunch of human beings. So for you, you need to understand the human beings first. And the way you understand a human being in the context in which he operates is the greeting. Now, the greeting in an African context, in most African context, the greeting is not just, hello, how are you? No, the greeting is the humanity in me is asking the humanity in you, how are you faring today? That is what it means to ask somebody how are you faring? So in the local language and the local context is how is your humanity faring today? And it's not just hello, how are you? Goodbye. But then 
be able to relate to the human being as a human first before your conceptualization of does it have a degree? Now, that for me is very, very substantial because before now, I was trying to validate my conceptualization of human capital development from my own understanding from the books and theories I have read about human capital development. But here am I confronted by a learned person, learned in the traditional way, but trying to educate me, you have to understand human first before you put a label on it of if you are developed or not. Now, that for me was very significant. And he now told me, look at the population that we have in this village. We don't have a school. We don't have a clinic. He said, my wife, when she was giving birth, because this time around she has stopped giving birth. When she was giving birth, we had to look for a traditional birth attendant that will come attend to her to give birth safely. Not in the clinic. I don't know if any of you have gone into the, um, a labor room. I went into one for the uh, birth of my first kid. And what women go through in that small room, even with epidural, which is the anesthesia you are given to give birth painlessly, the labor is intense. Here are you in a village with no health healthcare facilities. Women are giving birth on their own, only supported by healthcare attendants that are not educated, but they are skilled in using herbs and all manners of uh, assistance to be able to support women. That's one. The second is we don't have a school in this village. If you have to go to school, you have to go miles away down the line to go to school. So if your definition is average years of schooling of a country's population, then you're not going to count us. Are we not humans? Are we not worthy of your definition of humanity? Where does that leave us? The government is supposed to establish schools. If the government doesn't establish schools, then where do you expect us to go to school to get to fit your definition of average years of schooling of a country's population, then we're cut out. Then you are limiting our humanity if you do that. Now, it became very fundamental to me that I need to reflect on what I mean by human capital development, not because human capital development is not important, but maybe it's leaving out a huge chunk of what it means to be human in the context in which I was researching. Now, if you come back to my second story, which, I, which my interaction with this man led me to, is the story of the Good Samaritan. He said to me, the Good Samaritan was not the first that came over somebody that was lying on the ground almost lifeless. He may have been the second or third, but why did the Good Samaritan take care of this man there was a need of support almost at the point of dying. He mentioned to me that the little he could read is because of mission development work and the missionaries that established early years school that he was able to read and write. His challenge to me was, if we are not government and we are not carrying out mission work in terms of establishing schools and clinics, then we're failing a whole section of the society in which we want to define in terms of human capital development. His story to me about the Good Samaritan is, where is your humanity? The Good Samaritan has humanity in him. He didn't care to look at the ground if this person is a Muslim, is Hindu or Christian, or is from the same tribe with him. He just wanted to help a human being on the ground. His challenge to me was, how can you, as a development practitioner, also help humanity without defining and putting them in levels? Now, for me, that was a second lesson. How do we then begin to work with communities and, and, and people that we so very much want to help with the needed basic services without having to define them in our conceptualization of theories, the way we read them in books? Now, this man, 
uh, the clergyman that I met talked to me about how do you demonstrate the love of humanity in your own work? He is a missionary. He told me he is not from that village. He came to that village because they needed Christ. If he had the ability to establish schools and a clinic, he would have done that. But if you are not establishing schools and you're not establishing clinics, but your definition looks at the average schooling of uh, um, the population, then you need to go back and begin to look at that. Who do you talk to? Do you talk to the government or do you talk to missionaries? How do you as development practitioners begin to look at the gaps that exist in villages where we live for you to begin to make sense of us also needing to fit into the definition of what it means to be a, an, an educated or a, a schooling age population. The next thing he told me was, we listen to the radio. We listen to Voice of America. We listen to the BBC. We listen to Radio, radio Deutsche Welle. We know the well, amount of money that people in this country steal away from the government. That is the money they're supposed to provide the schools, the clinics, the hospitals. Now, this money is taken away by human beings in this country into other countries. The question he asked me is, the people that take away the money away from providing basic services to people like us in villages like this, are they actually human? Uh -huh. They understand that they are taking away the common wealth and the common resources that will establish schools for the children and clinics for the women and clinics for children that need, need, need healthcare services for, for them to also be able to fit into the definition of human capital development as conceptualized by you. Now, when they take this money out of the country, they take it to maybe Switzerland, they take it to England, they take it to US, they take it to Germany and all the tax heavens of the world because we listen to the VOA, we listen to BBC, we listen to Radio de Chauvela and it's in our native languages. The analysis and explanation is the people that take up the money away from us are not human. So what is your conceptualization of human capital development if you're not checking the humanity of the people that steal the resources away from us? Secondly, if you're not checking the humanity of the countries in which these monies are stolen and stashed away in, they're also colluding with the people that are not human to take away our common resources. Now, if you come here as a development practitioner, who do you represent? Are you representing these human beings that, are not, that have no humanity in them? Or are you trying to represent us and tell us about how we fit into the average age Average years of schooling of a country's population. Are you blaming us for not going to school and not fitting into your definition of human capital development? Why don't you point your fingers at the people that are taking out the funds into tax havens abroad? Why don't you question that humanity? There's a moral burden for both the people that take it away and the people that receive it and keep it for them. Now, back to my reflections on humanity in development. Are we human? If we want to check human capital development, the question about being human is to first of all ask, how do we provide the needed basic services for the people to be able to enjoy full life and their full agency for us to begin to see if we are calculating human capital development right? Your measure of human capital development index could be a hypocrisy if you don't check the people that take away the money and the people that receive them in tax havens abroad, like the Cayman Islands, the Dubais of this world, and the Switzerland of these places that have the uh, ability to keep stolen wealth from us. How can we create a human world in which we look at the people that are suffering from the terrible crimes of people that loot our countries? and make sure that they return the monies to establish the social services we need? And how can we go back to demonstrating the love of Christ? Now he came back to his own practice as a missionary. 
and he told me the mission, the, 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 the missionaries of those days were concerned about establishing not just a church, but also establishing a school and clinic and also providing water in villages because they knew that this was the needed basic necessities of life. Life in the lives of the people that they were serving. He quoted John chapter one, verse 14. And the flesh became human. He now questioned and challenged me. How can you, as development practitioners, go back to the humanity in which the world used to know? He said, the Westerners, all of the people that brought Christ to us, their forefathers had more humanity than them. Why is it that they are not challenging the fact that people take money from us here and keep in their own societies but they don't challenge them and we lack the schools. The churches that used to establish churches and schools and clinics no longer do that. Instead, they send you to come here and you're asking you, are you in school? Do you have a degree? If you don't, you're not being calculated as human capital index. But how, how about humanity first before what you call development? What is development to you if all of us don't have the basic social amenities that we have? Now, the reflection of a practitioner like me is to look at how do I support the people that I work with and meet their own needs without having to uh, uh, um, uh, compromise the values of institutions in which I work in. The values of institutions in which I work in is to look at me as a vessel, a vehicle to convey the ideas that they so want to pass through to the people and not help them in the way that they need. The question the man was asking me is, not, is there's nothing I can do about it because he wants to establish a school in his village, a clinic in his village. But I was not there to establish that for him. I was just collecting data to be able to calculate the human capital index of the place in which I wanted to research of the place in which I am now working as a worker in the developing institution that I'm serving. Now, I'll leave you with this thought. How can we proclaim in the same measure and demonstrate Christ in the same measure? Because the institution in which I work in beholds on you to expose your own values in the place of work. So if I am a Christian, I'm not supposed to show it. I'm supposed to be what they call objective and value neutral. But how can I, as a Christian, working in institutions like this, be able to influence the course of development in such a way that the basic needs of the people and the questions around humanity are also answered by me? How can I influence the policies of institutions like this in which I work and also be able to have a conversation around the institutions are working and the, and the, and, and the local communities we, we, we want to serve and put in the middle of it, the basic services that they need. Now it brings me back to what measure, what amount of time do you put on proclamation? If you're a missionary and I call that mission in development or mission as development, but what again, as you or do you also put in terms of quantity on demonstration, because you can proclaim the word of God and the awesomeness of God and all that is it that he is and represents. But if you are not demonstrating, then people look at you as, oh, you said these nice things, but I need food on the table. I will end up with Sermon on the Mount. Jesus Christ was able to proclaim the word of God, the awesomeness of God the greatness of God, the love of God, but he also used five fish and bread to feed the people because he knew for them to listen, they were also hungry. And the physiological, he needed to deal with that for them to concentrate on the message. So what weight do you put on proclamation? And what weight do you put on demonstration? 
For me as a practitioner in institutions that I, I work in, I'm constrained by the rules that I signed up to. But for us in mission, for us researching how Christian can also be able to use mission in development or mission as development to influence the cost of uh, service delivery is very important. I will stop there and um, maybe hear your reflections as well. Sorry, I took a bit of time, but thanks for listening. No, no, it was very good for them and very challenging. Um, really appreciate the hard questions and, uh, and this whole thing flowing around. What does it mean to be human? And and looking at different definitions that may be more compelling and more Christian than many of the definitions that we tend to use, especially in our in our. Uh, modern frameworks of poverty and life and, and all the rest. Um, now, for those of you who would like to ask a question of, of, of Fanon, at the bottom of your screen, if you're online, is a reaction button. And if you uh, click on that button down below, it'll say raise hands. I will do that on my screen. See what it looks like. And it'll look like that. So I will begin with John. Go ahead and ask your question or make your comment, John. Well, thank you very much, um, Tom, and thank you, Fanon, for your challenge. Um, and don't, my, it isn't a question, or at least it, what, what I have to say is more of a story. So if you don't mind sh the sharing of stories, because you've already shared a story. When I worked in development, in mission, with the African indigenous churches in Western Kenya. I heard stories um, about what happened when the missionaries, this would be the European missionaries of the 1920s, came and established schools and clinics. Um, the, ch the indigenous churches were not opposed to these, but what they saw happening through these two institutions was the, I think it's the disaggregation of society into classes. Mm -hmm. Whereas previously people had lived much more according to Ubuntu, that is a, a, a mutuality, an, an economy based upon mutuality. Uh, with the arrival of education, those who were educated had access to colonial government services, facilities, loans, uh, um, training for small businesses and things like that. They began to move ahead. They were generally Christians. They, they were quite well educated in, in, in the, um, within the mission schools. And they left behind other people in the village who had not had those privileges, if you like. So what you found in the indigenous churches, many of, many of the members of which did, had, had, had missed out on formal education for one reason or another, was a sense that they were truly human. And they could test their humanity because they believed they had the, 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 the spirit of God within them. It was a Pentecostal mission. I mean, it, they, they were strongly charismatic in, in, in a very broad sense. They believed in the power of the spirit. Um, and that the presence of that God spirit within you was to be tested by your relationships with other people in the community. And if you were not, if you kind of, if, if, if you treated them as lesser beings, rather in the way that you have suggested the human development, the capital development index treats them, then they, even though they called themselves Christians, the people who did this were lacking in the spirit of God. Now that was a basic, I'm not, this, this, this is grassroots theology. I'm not saying that's, <laughs> that's correct, but theologically correct. But I think you can understand the point there that, that the Holy Spirit of God 
was to be recognized in the strength of mutuality and care for other people within the community. And without it, despite your education, despite your riches, you lacked both the spirit of God and you lacked a key element of humanity. So that's a story, but I, something I've reflected on frequently. I don't know whether you have anything to say, uh, um, um, Fanin, uh, on that. Thanks, John. Uh, just to say, John, that you have lived the experience of an African community that looks at themselves as one, but also increasingly look at themselves as being in a global village. Now, uh, our forefathers early on understood the value of education, not as if they did not like education, they did, but they knew they had gone past the age of going back to formal education in the strict sense of getting a degree. What they advised and conversed for was to make sure that their children are offspring got access to education and brought back what they could not have, especially treatment of human beings in clinics where they struggle with some certain kinds of diseases that they could not explain. And once they could not explain a disease, they now termed it an infliction, an infliction of the devil. But if their children came back and were able to use tenacely or other forms of medication to treat a human being back to life. They saw the connection of Western education and the uh, improvement in their well being as part of what they needed to encourage their offspring to get into. Now, back to theology and the understanding of African communities in terms of who they are in a communitarian setting but also how they relate to the wider community and what you would call an outsider. The story of the Good Samaritan resonates with people like that. Now, he told me the Good Samaritan is what he normally uses to be able to enter into the hearts of people that don't know Christ. Understanding that all the people you come across, most of them see you as human, but they do not relate to you as human enough. But if you're a good Samaritan, looking at the humanity of people and the greeting which says, how is the humanity in you? How is the humanity in you doing today? Begins a conversation of, I respect you for who you are, but I also will attend to your own needs in the way that we lead. So I think uh, when uh, uh, Western education arrived and up till now, there are lots of places that don't have schools, but they strive to make sure that their kids go out there to acquire Western knowledge because they know that they need something that is a little bit extra from the way they're living. And they embrace it and agree with it, but they, 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 they uh, the people that see themselves as being educated and, and, and more of a class over them are also deeply, deeply uh, admonished. Because getting Western education does not mean you're not part of humanity that we also understand. It also makes you to be a tool to use yourself to liberate and encourage others within the community you live. But it's a conversation that we'll continue to have, John. <laughs> yes, thank you, Fanon. <laughs> I, I can't really uh, deny what you say about the value of education and clinics. I don't want to do that. I'm just talking about one, uh, one of the side effects and perceptions, as it were, from those below. Um, and yeah. I think, well, I, I, I'm really trying to do what I think you were doing in your presentation, which was to listen to the voices of those who are not within the system. Thank you for thank you very much for your presentation, by the way. Thanks, John. We'll turn to Israel and go ahead and unmute Israel and go ahead and ask your question. Uh, Tom, I raised my hand. 
Okay, thank you very much, Tom. Um, thank you for the lecture, uh, Dr. Fannin. Um, there are so many uh, sub themes uh, um, with, within the presentation. I don't know really um, um, where to, to focus the, the main uh, question or the intention of my question, but I understand that you were in disagreement with um, uh, using the measure of uh, education to acknowledge who is human or who is not human. And that uh, I completely agree. And also, um, I guess there are two different um, approaches to the definition of what or who is a human being, um, one who is uh, an essential a human being, and the one who acts uh, humanly. Um, I guess there are different levels of that. But what I wanted to ask you is uh, where in your in the development of your thought about human development, the criteria and the idea of empowerment comes in, or, or you in a way don't, uh, don't think empower, empowerment as a tool for a criteria, uh, because your last question is how can we influence institutions like where, where you are working? So the criteria of empowerment, which acknowledge the value, the essential value of human beings, no matter what they do, and the, the potential is somewhere in the development of your thought or not? That was my question. Thank you very much, Israel. This is a very important question at the heart of places in which we work and how we can use places in which we work to become listeners. So we're listening to the voices of the people that we, we intervene to support. So my presentation was a reflection on the voices of the people that we work with and how they view and in interpret what we do. Now, if this person, uh, if this clergyman I met understands the measure of human capital development or human capital index to be the average years of schooling of a country's population, immediately he's reacting and saying, if that is your definition, you are going to leave out maybe 20 or 30% of the population of which I am part of that percentage. I may not be educated or uh, have school education, but I have something I'm doing and I have an, I, I, my agency also needs to be taken into account when calculating your human capital index. So what, is, what does it mean to be human to you when you say human, capital, and development? Do you jump the human and go to the capital and development? So what does it mean to be human to you is the question he was asking me. Uh, I thank you very much for the question because empowerment is at the center of how do we create interventions that look at people with educational years of schooling or not, but be able to provide opportunities to increase their agency and to function and, and enjoy life and flourish. Now, if you put it in a box and you say, except you have some level of schooling and you're educated, then we cannot do anything about you. Then it leaves up a section of people. So my reflection is, how do we listen to people enough to be able to have interventions that attend to their needs, given their peculiarities, and increases the opportunity, increases their agency to be able to flourish? I'll tell you a sad story. I met somebody who is quite Western. Uh, he's a professor. He came to work with us, and he said, homeless people, 
men, people with mental health that are naked on the street, disabled people don't have agency. Now, there are people that hold on to these ideas. Is it right? Is the question. How do you hold on to a perception that a homeless person on the street does not have agency? How do you hold on to a perception that a mentally, uh, a mentally challenged person in Africa, they walk naked on the street. You see him and you say, or see her and you say, you don't have agency. It means you're not looking at humanity, but maybe you're looking at something else. So yes, uh, empowerment is at the center of increasing the agency of people in their peculiarities and in the context in which we work. How do you have interventions that look at this section and cross section of people to be able to make sense of this? Israel, the question you asked is not an easy one, but it's a conversation that we'll continue to have because there are people within the institutions that we work that look at these things from a very straight line and do not see humanity when they see development. Whatever they define as development is what they go after. How about humanity is a question that this man was asking me. I'll stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Fanon. Damon, go ahead. Yeah. We have Damon here at the center. Thank you, uh, uh, for your lecture. Uh, many years ago, uh, Sabine Akia, who, who works in Oxford, also came to our center here to talk about human development. And she actually came with her colleagues. She, she is a lecturer in Bath now, I think. So they also talk a lot about human development because they, they have this poverty index, yeah? They, they have in the, in, in the Oxford department. Yes, MPA. The same question came to me as a theologian. I, I asked the question, but what do you mean by human when you talk about human development? So that same question uh, also arose in my mind. And they said, well, that's a very important question. <laughs> but they didn't elaborate very much. But from a, from a the theologian point of view, you know, I understand human beings. Well, I think we need a holistic understanding of humanity. And then a holistic understanding of human development. That is, humanity has many aspects. And we need to grasp those. We have the cognitive aspect, the rational aspect, yeah? the technical aspect. And education will empower us to realize our potential in our intellect, in our skills, in our technical skill, in our engineering, in our health, in our whatever. But that's one, one aspect, which is important. We don't have the, the, the skill to, to, to cultivate the land. We have no food to eat, you know? That won't be very good for human development. <laughs> so we need those skills. But that's not the only thing about humanity. I think sometimes in the West, we stress on the technical side, the rational side so much. That, 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 that seems to be the only things count. So as long as we can get, give you good uh, education and empower you to be great engineer, great doctor, great this, this, and that, then everything will be fine. But no, it's not fine as we see in the West because humanity, being human means also being human in relationship, in, 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 you know, in relation to one another as human beings, in love, uh, hopefully, and in relation to God as his children. So the mutuality between human beings and between us and God, those are, are, are the essential aspect of humanity. No matter how good you are, an engineer, how brilliant you are, you're a doctor, if you don't relate to people with any measure of love or compassion, then we are, you're nothing. This is what Paul said, you know, if you, you can speak in tongues and this and that, but you have no love, then you're, you're really nothing. Human development index becomes zero in that, in that case. A brilliant does not give you anything if you, if you have no love. That's what Paul said. So I think we need, we need, a, we need a holistic understanding. But then the, uh, the, the, the mutuality aspect or the relational aspect or the ethical aspect is very hard to measure. <laughs> How do you measure love? You can measure education, but 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 count the number of degree that you have, and so, but that but that side is it's very elusive. But that that's where John comes in his story about 
Well, by recognition that the spirit is in you. <laughs> this guy has real humanity in him. You know, we can see the fruit of the spirit in him. But that doesn't give you, that's not, that's not graded by, by numbers. And, and, and so that's more a quantitative kind of data. And so I think we need a, a, a multiple approach, multiple approaches to really understand what it means to be human and how to assess the potential to which we have realized our humanity. We all have potential, but to, you know, in different aspects and, and, and to what degree have we realized that? that is, but sometimes it's not, that, that question cannot be answered by, by number. It has to be, often has to be answered by, by being sensitive to the Holy Spirit, I, I think. Yeah. It's not a question, it's just a reflection of what has been said so far. Hol holism, holism. Let's go with Marjorie. Go ahead and unmute Marjorie. Yes, thank you um, so much for your presentation. I um, actually uh, looked at your thesis a couple weeks ago when I was at OCMS uh, because your, uh, your thesis has to do with human development and I'm studying um, community health workers in, in South Asia. So um, I'm so glad to get to see you and meet you, uh, um, you know, in person, so to speak, via Zoom. Um, one of the things I wanted to kind of ask you about a little bit was just at the end of your talk, you, 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 you mentioned about how when you come into your work in the development organization, you're supposed to be in a value neutral kind of mentality. And I just say that that's impossible, that um, development organizations, which I've worked with, they have their values. And so when you come in to work with them, they're in a sense imposing the way they see the world on their, their, their workers and on the communities that they're serving. And one of the things I think is really exciting about your research is how you've gone to the grassroots and you've asked them, okay, what do you guys value? Well, how do you see the world? What is part poverty for you? What is development for you? And I just think that's fantastic and, and, and keep asking those questions. And so my question is, how do you, on a day-to-day -day basis, how do you interact in working in a secular development organization in this in, in a way because as a as one who walks in the fear of god we value the person in front of us because they're created in god's image regardless of their capacity for whatever mentally physically emotionally it doesn't matter created in the image of god and so how do you as a development officer interact with 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 that that understanding and belief in an organization that in a sense tries to devalue it seems like they devalue people and putting them into categories I, I, yeah i hope my 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 thinking makes sense to you no misery you you are you are, you are spot on i i i would say i would start by saying the organizations we work in have values. No, have values. They have a set of value that they want you to adhere to. But your own value orientation and background, if it conflicts with that, they may like your knowledge and expertise to help them to attain their own values, but they don't want yours to influence their own. Now, this is the struggle of a practitioner. I am a Christian. I am working in an institution that has its own set of values, but I have my own value orientation as well. How do I bring that as a Christian practitioner to be able to influence the way that and shape things um, in a way that I think will be um, pleasing to God? Now, most of these places don't want to hear in Jesus' name or oh God. The first question to ask is, what does that mean? Uh, if that is who you are, is that what you're using to impose or transpose on the work we have recruited you to do? So you have to create a balance between saying, 
I am who I am. This is my name. This is my background. But I have signed up to work within the value framework of your own organization. This is a different, it's a difficult dynamic and different, difficult uh, uh, way of working. And I am not saying our way, our way of life do not influence the way we work. It does. But how do you keep it at a way that you're not infringing on the rules upon which you're recruited to project? But also within the same platform, also use that as the basis to project humanity and demonstrate the love of God. Now, I'll go back to the story of the Good Samaritan. The story of the Good Samaritan says, human beings are extremely difficult. To hit somebody that is in a pool of blood on the ground, he stole from him, maybe his life saving, is horrible. Now, in the places we work, what you are told is, don't even go close. It is not your position to do that. During office hours, I may not do that. But in my time and space, I can go and do and attend to the needy on the ground. And that is a projection of my humanity and the value framework from which I operate. The next morning, I report back to the office and they ask me, why did you do that? I did that because this is the love I have in me for humanity and the suffering of this person. But today I'm reporting to you as your own staff and worker. Within the rules and hours, which you say I should work, I may not do that. But outside, I am also my person and I can be able to attend to the world and the influence I have on the world. Now, it's a struggle. Without being hypocritical, sometimes you bring your own value framework to shine through and people see the value you bring to your own office and work. In every way you see, who you are is defined by your own value framework from your own home bringing, from your own family into the workspace. And if we begin to lose that, we're then losing our humanity because where we come from is very important. I'll stop there. Good. And Al, go ahead and unmute and ask your question. Oh, you're muted, Al. Thank you. I rushed in there without unmuting. Thank you, Dr. Fine. Fascinating. My question is, I'm on the same sort of page as Marjorie just now. How do we, one, establish what human value is publicly? Secondly, how do we persuade from our Christian viewpoint in interaction what better human values are as Christians? I always like the um i like what gibbon said as he analyzed why christians took over the roman empire when he said christians thought better loved better and died better than everybody else they thought better loved better died better than everybody else those first three centuries and eventually the whole roman empire collapsed at their feet through what is their Christian testimony. In a way, what you're saying is, although your workplace is scheduled, um, you know, you, you, your Christian values will break through, is what you're looking towards, through the secular, secular interaction of values with Christian values. But my question goes a bit further back, because we, in Chile, are trying to establish the value of the human being in a constitution. We, thank God, rejected that crazy constitution we were going to accept. But as I look around, I find very few, and I wonder what yours does, very few constitutions that try to establish the worth. The closest I come is not a constitution, the uh, American Declaration of Independence, 1776, when, you know, you say... Um, it is self-evident, I understand it was going to say, it is sacred that all uh, human beings that, that are created equal. And now that brings in, of course, a God element, 
the, the, the human beings are made in the image of God. Basically, human beings made in the image of God is a, an incredible statement in a constitution. Do you have something like in your constitution, in your more public place that tries to establish what is the value of the human being? Because even the French constitution has not helped uh, to, to establish in a long-term way the value of a human being. Thank you, my brother. A bit long, but, but there you go. Thank you. This is, uh, this is uh, a question that goes way back, and I also take you way back. Uh, in Africa, especially in Nigeria, Christianity yeah. was accepted because of the value that the native African, especially in Nigeria, so true Christianity. I'll give you an example. Thou shalt not kill. Now, when you say thou shalt not kill, you are speaking to the converted or speaking or preaching to the choir. Because already in the native African setup where I come from, killing is not in the preserve of a human being. It is not yours to take. So there are very, very uh, uh, the layered ways of making sure you reconcile humanity if you kill a human. It may be by accident, but you have to pay back with layers of atonement that makes you back into humanity because you have gone beyond the line of taking a human, which you're not supposed to and no one is allowed to. Now, how do you then look at the Christian values within the reflection of what already exists as a value framework in the community that I come from or in African communities where we serve. That already exists. So how to reflect that? It is not, you must not go and write it in the constitution now in a polarized and divided world, but your Christianity will shine through and connect to the value framework that already exists. You can leverage that as a powerful tool to begin to use that without even saying it. You shall not kill. So no matter what other circumstances, it's not your position to begin to pull up arms and kill. I'll give you a story, my friend. Yeah. This man asked me, we listen to the radio. And in America, people have guns and they kill themselves. Are they human? Is he allowed? So this is a very difficult question. They listen to the radio, VOA, uh, uh, BBC, Radio Dutchavela. It's in the native language. So the analysis are also broken down to the language. So they follow, and they follow globally. What they taught us as Christians, we're not Christian. Have they lost their humanity? What is happening in that place? You shall not kill. It's sacred. Why are they killing themselves? Now, all I'm trying to tell you is the world is so polarized. In the time and age where in, 19, in 1776, everyone is created equal was written, may not be able to be written today in the same way. But it was done because of the, 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 the value of Christianity shining through in the society and communities in which we live. And that has been a reflection in the uh, American society up to now. In summary, my friend, our Christianity shines through. If yeah. we leverage the existing value framework that exists and begin to view on that, it's easier than having to create rules and having to go to the parliament to put it. <laughs> Thank you. I'd like, I'd, like, I'd like to interact with you a little. OK. Um, really appreciated what, what you brought out. And, and also, I think John's question got at kind of a little bit of sort of the tensions that begin to develop. Because when you get the development of gross domestic product, when you begin to accrue wealth, there seems to be a greater stratification of society yeah. and that you get pools of wealth and pools of poverty. And when you look around the world, you tend to see those sort of things often occur. 
Um, one of the things, though, that I've come across, and it actually came about initially with a conversation that I had here in Oxford with a person who's an economist at the university, and there's new ways of measuring and ways of looking at what it means to develop or what it means to be you know, flourishing. And, and one of those, which I really recommend that you take a look at, because there's a big debate about it, and it's an interesting debate between leading economists around the world, but it's the Bhutan measure of gross national happiness, yeah. which, which, which looks at which poverty has been reduced, medical care has increased, but through different ways of measuring and different ways of looking at what they're doing, it's not just in terms of just rushing in with medical care, schools, and that kind of thing, although that's part of it as well, but thinking about it in different ways of measurement and different ways of interacting with the population. Now, one of the things that you'll note in terms of the ongoing academic debate on this is there have been some powerful criticisms of what's called the Gross, uh, gross national happiness measure versus <laughs> gross domestic product. And what you find actually though is, is a real uh, a fruitful conversation between the different parties in this to, to, to bring out both strengths and weaknesses within the Bhutanese model. And I was just thinking in terms of fun and where you're going and the kind of questions that are being asked of you by people on the ground is maybe looking at different ways of measuring, evaluating, and working with populations to look at how wealth impacts a community, mm -hmm. how medical care, how stratification takes place, and what may be some different avenues and trajectories to take, take note of and develop in light of alternative models to how we measure quote unquote progress or development. There, I think often they get locked into ways of looking at it that are that actually lead to greater unhappiness than greater happiness and joy. Um, I've never heard of a Christian joy uh, 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 measure, but maybe we need one um, uh, to find out what is the balancing between the various pressures that are facing our universe and come up with new paradigms to think and measure what it means to really flourish. Um, your thoughts on that, Benin? Thank you, Dr. Harvey. Um, the one thing that will ever happen, will continue to happen and will never stop is Everybody is not going to be equal on the same level in terms of a ruler. There will be some level of inequality. With increasing education, you leave people behind where you have a degree or two or three and other people don't. You begin to accrue wealth according to the frameworks in which where you're working, better employment, better chances of being employed and employability, especially in the digital world, and other people that do not accrue the same level of learning and experience. That will continue to exist. But the question is, what framework do we have for distributing justice is what we're not looking at critically. Now, distribution in terms of creating opportunities, not handouts and giving people things on the street, that is not the distribution we can, can, can vast for, but a framework where opportunities are created because some people quite frankly say, I would rather go to the Sangare school and acquire Arabic education, which also has numeracy and literacy. And that is what makes me flourish. They're entitled, but then they should also know that the opportunities are created for you to also be able to know that in a digital economy in which we're heading to, you may not be able to qualify to work in certain places if you don't have X, Y, Z in terms of learning experience and qualification. It's a choice they're making. You're making a choice to go to a Sangaya school 
acquire even a master's in Islamic education and reading of the Arabic and uh, 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 Ajari, which is okay. If that is what makes you flourish, the opportunity is created for you. But there's a trade-off. It is not as if the opportunities are not created. They are created and they're out there for you to explore. The question in a place like Nigeria and other African places I, I imagine is these opportunities are not so, so, so created and people are denied. The village in which I collected my data, the man told me we want to get Western education for our children, but the schools are not here. So is it uh, by, by our own making or the making of our kids that we may not qualify to be measured uh, in terms of the average years of schooling of a country's population, it is not our fault. Then how do we then create the opportunities that give the children access if they so want to and if the parents are also allowing of that? Now, this is something that we need to step back and think through because as Christians, we are called to look out there and look at the people that we serve in terms of proclaiming the word of God. I am a Christian. I proclaim the word of God in my space. I may not have the tools to proclaim on the pulpit as a, as a clergyman, but I have the tools to demonstrate and be able to work with communities to create opportunities, listening to their voices and creating opportunities for them to participate. Now, how do we then get that into the national framework? of a country like Nigeria to create the opportunities that people so desire and yearn for, and then create the funding that goes into it rather than take the funding away to Switzerland banks and all these places. So it's something that we can uh, continue to debate, but creating a framework that creates an opportunity for distributing opportunities is what we have not really found. But inequality will continue. And as we grow and become more, um, enlightened and, 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 and educated, we may lead people down the strata, but then if we have a framework that attends to their own different needs based on their own voices and needs, then the, 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 the options are there for them to tap in. It is up to them. Thank you, Tom. Uh, thank you, Tom. Um, yeah, I just want to give a, a, a commendation on your work because, you know, uh, our Christian voice and values which needs to be uh, spoken amongst secular economists and secular scholars. Secular economists and scholars and development workers or managers, they have their own sets of values. Some of them may be Christian, some of them may not be Christians. But we as Christians need to, to join them and to mix with them in order to voice out our Christian perspective of development or human development. We cannot just sit on our own in our own circle and speak amongst ourselves about human development. No matter how, how sophisticated, how theological our discussion amongst ourselves can be, but that does really not much significance unless we take our ideas and engage with the secular world uh, and, and interact with them and so that we can actually mutually benefit one another. We are not saying we have nothing to learn from them, we have, but they also may have, but certainly they, they have something to learn from us. So I really commend you in this effort to, to try to integrate the Christian gospel and, and human development together. Oh, good. Well, Damon, well, Dem Dem let me say this, Tom. Let me just say this, Damon. As I sit on this seat in this office, the greatest joy I have is people come to me and say, what makes you do the things you do? I say, I'm a Christian. Mm. In that space, I can tell you I'm a Christian and I'm doing this thing because of my belief system and the value framework yeah. I'm coming from and my family values. Now, yeah. anybody that looks at me and say, if it's fun, then he will not do that. That is the definition of who we are as Christians and operating in a system that they know you're supposed to be value-free, back to Marjorie's point, but I am shining through without preaching to you yeah. in your face, but my actions are speaking for me and they say, Fanon is known for this. He's a man of faith. 
he will not do that. Our Father oh. is known for this. He's a man of faith. This is what he will do, even if he comes here tomorrow. Behind you, your testimony shines through them. Thank you, Demo. We thank God. We thank God for him. Yeah, thank God. Well, Fannin, I want to thank you for an excellent lecture today and really challenging us. Um, I think these are absolutely critical questions for a place like OCMS to be grappling with. So good to hear your voice again and to see that you're having an impact out there where you're at. <laughs> and uh, we just offer an, an, our prayers up for you and blessings to you as you go about your yeah. work. And thank you for everyone joining. And this will be the last lecture of the year and we will begin again in March. So with that, uh, and I promise Marjorie, I'll be much better in terms of getting ahead and getting a schedule to all of you because I have been remiss in this regard. So please uh, 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 want, receive my sincere say... apologies in that. So blessings upon you all yeah. and look forward to seeing you and have a Merry Christmas, by the way. As you Merry call. Christmas. OCM is trendly uh, well. Thank you, Tom. All right. Yeah, we can, uh, <laughs> I hope you'll come back to Oxford to visit us, Bennett. I yes. will come, Damon. I will try and come back. Thank you so much for having me. And you baked me well. I'm a big okay. individual around it. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Thank you. Bye-bye, Bye. -bye, Tom. Bye.